My name is Maria Andrea Nardi and I'm an affiliated researcher at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights here in Lund and also at Lund University. Um, I'm a geographer, graduated from here, uh, from the Department of Social and Economic Geography. So my presentation for today, um, I consider more like a, an exercise where I would like to bring uh, issues of geography and human rights. Uh, and I hope that we can do it also during the, the whole um, afternoon to think how space, public space, uh, environment, green areas uh, can work towards human rights realization and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Argentinian and how do I do? so as an Argentinian when thinking of human rights uh, the first thing that comes to our head I know here are some Argentinians so maybe they can concur it's uh, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo a human rights organization that started in 1977 of 14 mothers that went to the Mayo Square Plaza de Mayo in the city of Buenos Aires to protest against the government because they wanted to know where their children were. They were forced, disappeared, and there went 14 females, mothers, to protest. And we know they are international, they have been, um, uh, how you say, nominee for the Nobel Prize, uh, and we know a lot about the role as mothers, but little we discuss about the second part of the name, which is plaza, which means square, and why, uh, and this is, I think, very topical we, we, to bring here. Madres de Plaza de Mayo then started protesting, and the police came in, in an April of 1977 to say that they should circulate, they couldn't stay there protesting. They were removed out of the, of the square. So in order to, uh, to say yes, but at the same time continue their protest, they start giving rounds around this obelisk. Hmm? So this uh, became a powerful symbol. Every Thursday, these women will gather here to go around the, um, the obelisk. And we know this, and still today we have these rounds. The mothers become grandmothers, they start uh, fighting for the um, appearance of their grandchildren that were um, dis disappeared in the captivity of the parents. Mm -hmm. So, as I say, when thinking of human rights as space, then space, um, and, and we tend to think of political rights, mm -hmm. but I like to go beyond uh, this. Sorry. So, as geographers, we are always interested in seeing the relation between space and society, between individuals and peoples and, and the environment. Mm? So how can we bring human rights uh, into the discussion here uh, for advance of political, economical, social rights, but also environmental? Mm? Uh, I like to think here space as environment where we cannot have rights, political rights, uh, if we don't have environmental rights. Hmm? Who wants to participate or be integrated in a very polluted environment, for instance? Who can participate if he has no access to food, if he has no access to nature, to get the means of survival? So I like to think of space and environment as a condition to enjoy human rights, but also as a right in itself. Hmm? So let's come back to the Plaza de Mayo. Plaza de Mayo, from people from Buenos Aires like me, uh, is a very symbolic landmark in the city. And we go there every time we have to protest against the government, but also when we have to support the government. It's a place of manifestation, but as you see here also it's a green space uh, where we can enjoy uh, time mm, together. Um, Plaza de Mayo, as many other Hispano-American uh, squares, has been structuring the urban life in the, in the Spanish colonies. Hmm? So we need to understand then the role of squares in a historical perspective, because they were central in ordering the urban life and the expansion of urban life in the Americas. Hmm? 
So these urban patterns where every city in Latin America uh, has a square. Uh, it's uh, like this because of the law of the Indies that indicated that the Spaniards uh, have to conform rural uh, urban spaces in their colonies in order to expand their empire in, into the territories. Mm -hmm. uh, so also it was the place where modernization colonialism and capitalism later was expanding into the Americas. So I think this is very important to, to take into consideration, the histories of squares, of, of uh, plazas in the Americas, because these functions change uh, historically, because we need also to think in context, right? From our colleagues in Zimbabwe, the squares, the plazas might mean something else, because you don't have these patterns, urban patterns, uh, that we have in, in, in Latin America. It was, uh, as I say, a landmark. Uh, here the Spaniards uh, located their um, main buildings, public buildings, the powers. We have the cabildo or the um, governor's house and we have the religious power, the uh, church. Mm? This is a picture, for instance, in, in Lima. Uh, that I'm bringing here to show also how green is incorporated in, in, into this uh, very symbolic landmark. But also we have another case in Quito, the Plaza de San Francisco, which is known to be constructed uh, on top of um, Inca's temple. So also these sort of landmarks where um, these plazas and church were built on top of other civilizations. So this symbolic... Um, very aggressive and violent uh, um, process of conquering has to be also be taken into account because squares were not for everyone. Squares were only for the Spaniards and those born in the colonies where indigenous populations could not have access. In fact, at that time, they were not even considered humans. Mm -hmm. So human rights, uh, of course, was out of the question. So what are the functions and services uh, of public space, squares and plazas, what I'm more focusing now? Uh, we can say that political, uh, from a political, social and cultural um, and economic, their main function is to support social life in the public, the development of community and civic engagement and social capital. Mm -hmm. But I also would like to introduce the environmental and ecological one, because now we know, and I think this is why we are all together here, to discuss also uh, the importance from a green perspective. There are ecological functions and services that the squares, green area parks, plazas provide to the cities, which is to regulate temperature, hydrological cycles, support biodiversity, increase individual well-being. So without this well-being, we cannot participate politically. So we can talk about like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, should we participate politically to have green spaces or should we have green spaces before in order for us to be able to be a fully political uh, individual? Um, so let's go more into details in three different aspects using the example of Buenos Aires, where I come from and where I grew up. Um, Porteños, people from, from Buenos Aires, as everyone knows us, we have a square to protest for everything. So if we want to protest and, uh, education policies, we go to one square where we have the uh, palace of um, the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, all these pictures are from this year. I, I found it amazing um, that there are many issues going on, but also that people is using space. Um, if we have a problem about a law that we want to pass, for instance, um, abortion law that now is in the top in the agenda in Argentina and other uh, Latin American countries, we go to the parliament or Plaza del Congreso. Uh, now we have problems with the justice because we think there has something been uh, politically manipulated in the justice system. We go to the Plaza Tribunales or La Valle where the uh, tribunales or the justice courts is uh, located. And if we have problems with the governor, with the president, to welcome him or to take him out or her, we go to Plaza de Mayo. Hmm? <laughs> so tell me your problem, I'll tell you the square, <laughs> basically. Um, but also the squares are spaces of uh, encounter, not only for political reasons, to, for protests, but also economically and cultural. And here, sometimes it's easy to separate what is political, what is economic, cultural, 
I think of people enjoying uh, green space is also very political in some contexts. But I want to show here also that uh, in different cities uh, around uh, Latin America, there has been a claim for public space to um, express different cultural um, yeah, processes. Like for instance, selling um, handicrafts, selling uh, local food, urban agriculture and peri-urban agriculture. So it's a space where people can channel also um, a protest in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, here uh, squares are being used uh, as a place where markets are located and it can be itinerary or it can be every day. So there are different ways. Uh, for instance, I found this uh, Feria del Artesano called Pachamama, which means uh, Mother Nature, and it's a strong um, claim of different communities uh, to think of nature in a different way, right? So against plastic, against uh, modern life, we have different um, art to show that we can produce and consume different. Mm -hmm. And then um, ecological, environmentally, which is uh, as equal as important, green spaces uh, provide ecosystem services. So we can think also of these green spaces in different scales in the city, but also in a square, as um, providers of biodiversity. Well, I mean, and also this can be tricky from a health point of view, but um, they um, regulate temperature. Mm -hmm. They provide carbon sequestration, but also a production of oxygen. They reduce pollution and regulate noise, which is very important. And of course, water infiltration. In Buenos Aires City, uh, which has very little percentage of green areas, this has been proven key because we have important problems of flood, floodings. And of course, this saves energy, um, helps the quality of air and decreases floods. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you want details and the ecological, I think I will leave this to my colleagues in the Center of Ecology, but they are experts in this. So if we think in them from a planning perspective, how uh, we should plan human rights cities, then we should first think of the cities in the historical and geographical context. As I say, in Latin America, the city were the entrance for the colonial empire to export, first to enter into rural areas and then to shift to the metropolis. But this might not be the case in other regions of the world. Uh, we need to understand this multicultural history, these sort of different uh, levels of history and meanings attached to public space. Um, different public space and uh, change according to the different also values that people give. Um, for instance, in the colonial times, the squares were for the aristocrats. And then this, during the independence, it changed, and it was the bourgeoisie that took over the squares. Um, we need to understand then these cultural and ecological functions. And if we want an inclusive uh, society and cities, we have to create multifunctional space that also uh, takes into consideration this physical infrastructure to facilitate inclusion and participation. And this we've been discussing a lot in, in the groups. And we we'll need to scale up. I mean, it's good to understand how squares work, but we need to have a network of squares. Mm -hmm. So this is also, from a geographical perspective, very important. So if I have a little more time, I'd like to bring quickly, okay. Uh, if this is so important, then what are we doing to generate public space? Uh, so I was um, yeah, trying to find out what is happening in, in, in Latin America. And I, I see that there are huge urban uh, projects taking uh, place when, when different sort of financing mm, and also different levels of community engagements. People is participating more or less and uh, creating more inclusive and accessible public space. So the, I will quickly say the examples. Uh, in the 90s, um, we have these very large scale um, urban projects. Uh, the water restoration probably are um, a good example. Uh, financed by the World Bank or the International Development Bank. And in Argentina, we have two different cases, Puerto Madero in the city of Buenos Aires and Puerto Rosario in, uh, in, in another province on, on a river. And what I want to say here is that people have been um, 
participating in different ways in these different projects. And the result we see in Puerto Madero, very elitist and only um, for the upper class. Uh, whereas in Rosario, uh, the green spaces has been maintained and also different cultural facilities where everyone in the city can access. Uh, this is very different from Puerto Madero where only tourists and, and rich uh, people. Uh, then also is the taking over of railway lands and this has to do with harbors and railways that are not being used anymore because the economies are inserted in the global world in a different way. So people in these cases in the city of Buenos Aires have been much more engaged in using this and claiming uh, the railway land to be used different. And I like this case that has been now in April this year uh, inaugurated. It's in the middle of the city also. And what I like is that people, they wanted to use the land for green areas and for playground for children, but also to use the old warehouse that it was not used to host different uh, activities, uh, a sports center, a garden, and uh, a small agriculture uh, experiment um, yeah, plot, uh, a playground, a covered playground, but also a library. And I think this is fantastic because um, people is struggling in between green spaces, how to use it open, but also creating libraries. And this is something that I really miss when I go to Buenos Aires. They are not public libraries. So I thought it was a nice case. Um, Quickly, I want to mention this. I thought it was fantastic in Colombia. They call it like uh, bonding the city because what they're doing is to uh, create more urban land, um, closing um, railways that have been uh, constructed uh, on the surface. Um, then this concept is very interesting. Pocket, uh, plaza de bolsillo or pocket parts. It's land that is momentarily uh, underused, it's not being used and it's, um, it's misused or they are um, growing vegetation in the middle of, of uh, urban land. So the idea that people, the communities can be engaged to, to ask for resources and create temporary plazas, right? So to have a mobile infrastructure that they can be taking over these vacant lots, uh, slots for a while and anchor people, the people passing by can see it and, and see a mural, mural art, uh, has food trucks. Um, it's temporary, but who knows, maybe the uses, the function that is different makes this less uh, temporary. And yes, this is not from, from Latin America, but it's very similar from the problem, uh, the New York City Plaza program that also consider resources to create uh, plazas in, in, the, um, in avenues and, and plots that are not being used within the, the, the streets. And, yeah. and you have one day plazas, interim plazas and permanent plazas. People, communities has to be engaged uh, in these uh, activities to see if they like the plazas they would like to to construct in, in these sort of lands that are not well used. So finally, I want to finish this maybe with a less positive <laughs> uh, tone, is at the same time that we, we are creating public space, we are also enclosuring um, squares and parks. And the reasons are different, uh, but I think we have to, to be um, in terms of, yeah, of claiming our rights and using a green space and, and, and plazas to protest. We have to be cautious also of this, how uh, we are fencing more and more uh, public space and what, has, what is the outcome of this? Why is this happening? Hmm? Um, so thank you, I will finish here then.